Thank you, Neil. Thanks very much for inviting us, and it's great to be in the county that uh, helped to give birth to the Labour movement. Yay. Uh, we have something in common with Derby. We had an industrial dispute, actually, that, that predated the Toll Puddle Martyrs by a few months. It was the Silk Mill lockout, and it was allegedly one of the first, if not the first, industrial disputes anywhere in the country, if not the world. And so uh, I think our two parts of the country have uh, a lot in common and uh, of course Derby was the, as you may or may not know, the first place in England to elect a Labour MP. We elected a bloke called Richard Bell who was elected on the, in the same election that Keir Hardy was elected but Keir was able to claim to be the very first Labour MP elected because uh, um, the elections in those days, those days were held over two days and the declaration in Merthyr Tidville was uh, the 24 hours before the one in, in Derby and we can still claim to be the first in England however because obviously that's in Wales so <laughs> anyway but yeah so uh, well no it's uh, it's good to be here I mean it's great to see the party in rude health in, in, in places uh, uh, like Dorset and what I'm finding all over the country is that there is a a huge upsurge in support for the party, a huge interest in joining the Labour Party and we now have you know, active constituencies and branches in places where we never previously had a Labour footprint at all and we're able to put candidates up in, in areas for local council elections in places where we never were able to field anybody before. And the reception that people are telling me, I don't know what you're, whether you're finding it, but when the people are going around and speaking to constituents on the doorstep and so on, uh, they're finding a, a really receptive audience and a lot of people saying, oh, it's fantastic to see the Labour Party, we have never seen anybody from the Labour Party. And so, you know, I think the, the future bodes well for us. And partly because there's never been an easier time to campaign for the Labour Party. I make this point all over the country. If you actually look at Labour's programme now, it's actually supported by the overwhelming majority of the British public. If you look at bringing the water industry back into public ownership, for example, around 83% of the public want that to happen. It's in the high 70s for bringing the railways back and the gas and the electricity back into public ownership. Similar levels of support for scrapping tuition fees, for investing in, in council housing, for creating meaningful jobs again, giving young people a future, a stake in society and so on. So it's, it's a great time to be uh, active, I think, in the Labour Party. We're, we're living in historic times, there's no doubt about that, and that's not just about Brexit. I just think the, the appetite for common sense socialism has never been greater, to be honest with you, and it's not just in this country either. I think there's a real yearning for a socialist alternative all over the world, even in the United States of America, and I was over there in September as part of the Democracy Roadshow, believe it or not, and went sort of stateside, and uh, was uh, speaking to the New York branch of Labour International. Labour International were the constituency which kind of represents expats all over the world, but they were the uh, <coughs> branch, constituency, if you like, of the party that had put that motion forward to conference around open selection, but managed to re reselection, so, so it's great to be there, but you know, what we're seeing, I mean, we saw the kind of upsurge of support for uh, Bernie Sanders, we saw, um, uh, was it Fran uh, uh, what's her name? Francesca, is it Antonia uh, Ocasio-Cortez, who was uh, elected, actually, what's her first name? Alexander, Alexander that's it, yeah, Alexander uh, Ocasio-Cortez. Um, and she's been elected with an overwhelming uh, uh, majority, but the, the key thing was winning the uh, the primary to be actually selected as the, as the Democrats' uh, candidate, and uh, that's one of the things I think just around about you know the whole issue of uh, of open selections is that every other democracy around the world as far as I can tell have open selections open primaries because she actually replaced a um, a stalwart didn't she of the uh, of the uh, democrat uh, party and uh, people didn't see it was a, as a democratic outrage that 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 happened so I think we need to embracing uh, democracy because it was Tony Benn who said that in order to democratise our society, we need to democratise our party first. So there's a long way to go, and I'll perhaps come back on to uh, talking a bit if we've got time uh, around uh, the sort of democracy review. But I was asked to speak a bit about about pensions, about the NHS, about housing, uh, in my sort of few remarks this afternoon. And uh, just in relation, you just had a con uh, speech from uh, who was? Where is she? She's she, she gone. She's still here. Where are you? 
Hey there, comrade. Yeah, sorry, mate. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, but I know what you said, but I'm, but I'm strongly supportive of uh, the campaign. Uh, the Waspy campaign, the Back to 60 campaign, I think is something that we should be embracing, I think, as a party. But there's more that we need to do, I think, to create the space to encourage the party to incorporate that commitment into the manifesto. Uh, let's remember, we are the sixth biggest economy in the world. Mm -hmm. And it's all about political priorities, it seems to me, in the end. It's where our political priorities lie. I mean, for the last 40 years, including under the 13 years of New Labour, sadly, the people who benefited most from the economic model that we adopted after Margaret Thatcher's Tories came into office in 1979 has obviously led to greater inequality and has benefited the faceless corporations and the, and the wealthy elites. We've had socialism for the rich, effectively, haven't we? And uh, we've had corporate scroungers with their hands out for, uh, for, for grants from government for things like research and, uh, and development, uh, whilst we are undermining our social security system, whilst we're expecting uh, people to work longer and longer, whilst we're reneging on you know, a, a solemn pledge, I think, that was made uh, in relation to uh, women's uh, pensions. And uh, we need to, I think, make sure that we are providing a social security system, including pensions, which are, you know, fit for purpose, which are um, commensurate with a economy that is the sixth biggest in the world. And as I say, it's all about political priorities. Because if you think back to 1945, when we came into office um, with a socialist programme, the first majority Labour government that had ever been elected, c coming out of a country that was ravaged by war, where we had a debt to GDP ratio over 250% and Churchill telling Clem Attlee that the country was broken, we couldn't therefore make any uh, commitments or he couldn't make any outlandish commitments because the first priority was to repay the debt. And of course Clem told him in 1945 parlance to do one. And we built the National Health Service, created the National Health Service, the welfare state, built a million new homes, maintained full employment and created an economic system which stood the test of time for 34 years. Bigger and bigger proportion of the national income every single year, if you look at the graphs, from the late 40s, right the way through to, well, really to Thatcherism, to be honest with you, uh, a bigger and bigger proportion went to workers in their wage packets. Inequality was getting narrower and narrower. We got to a place where, you know, working class youngsters were able to aspire to buy their own home in the teens. I mean, I was able to do that as a as a 19-year-old apprentice bricklayer, able to buy my own brand new house, backing onto a waterfront in a desirable village eight miles south of Derby, and it was only three times that I was earning as an apprentice bricklayer. Me and my girlfriend had saved up for a, for a year. It felt like a lot longer, because obviously that was a much bigger proportion of your life in those days. My year now is kind of nothing, but then it felt like a long time. But that, that kind of thing was doable, and um, it's, it's kind of impossible now. And so I think it's really important, therefore, that we, that we do as a party, as a movement, make the case, make the argument, and make those demands for a, uh, a social security system that, that's fit for purpose. And that includes having a, a pension system which is fit for, for purpose, and the present arrangement is, isn't fit for purpose. And, and then... Um, I say it is about political priorities, but it's, but, you know, we are, as I've already said, an incredibly wealthy country, and um, irrespective of what happens with, with Brexit, we will get wealthier, I believe, and we're also in the midst of this technological revolution, which is taking place right now, the fourth industrial revolution, and the, the question is, are we going to secure the fruits of that technological revolution for the many? Or are we going to leave it in the hands of the private sector, leave it in the hands of the market to determine who gets the benefits of that technological revolution? And those of you that are of a, of a, of a certain generation will remember how we were told in the 1960s to be ready for the leisure generation in the 1990s or early 2000s, where we're going to be working 15 hours a week. And that's not, or wasn't then, a new idea. John Maynard Keynes predicted in 1930 that we will only by 2030, working around 10 or 15 hours a week, will be awash with, with spare time. And uh, 
you know, some of the great thinkers over the uh, over the years, uh, including Karl Marx and uh, and others, uh, you know, have made that point. And it's a question, really, as I say, about you know, well, how do we organise ourselves? How do we organise society in a way to ensure that we that we can have a much reduced working week? How we can have you know the fruits of the economy that benefit uh, the majority? And I think again, going back to that 1945 example, yes, it was true that the country was uh, was in huge debt. But by the end of the 1940s, you know, we were in a much better place, actually, economically. We were starting to kind of massively <coughs> reduce the, the sovereign debt and uh, living standards were, were improving. And I think what it demonstrated was that when you kind of invest in the economy, when you put money in the pockets of ordinary workers, when you have a social security system which is more fit for purpose, which is compassionate, which recognises people's needs instead of demonising people, which is what we're seeing at the moment, <laughs> that has a beneficial knock-on effect. You try to create an economic virtuous circle because people with on modest incomes and middle incomes, <coughs> when you've got a bit more money, we tend to spend it. Mm. When you give the super rich and the faceless corporations a load of brass, they don't spend it. They just Their wealth pots kind of grow <coughs> and uh, it doesn't really benefit the economy. And this sort of notion of trickle-down economics has been totally exploded, in my opinion. It's just simply not worked for the vast majority of, of people. It's certainly not working economically for us. <coughs> And so I think we should, uh, you know, be supporting the, the calls for uh, uh, pension justice uh, as a party, as a membership. We need to be pressing for that, passing resolutions. And um, I know that Jeremy and John are sympathetic to it, but it's not just a one-way street. I know we've John and you know, Jeremy's leader, but um, it's not got complete freedom to move. It's about um, there are certain forces of conservatism, as we know, inside the Labour Party, and we need to address that. But if we can, as, as grassroots party members, you know, create the space and give the support to to Jeremy and so on, then that makes it easier, you know, to develop those common sense socialist uh, policies going forward. And um, you know, that's really why I think, or one of the reasons why Jeremy says, you know, you are the messengers. I mean, and it's really important that we take that that message out and we continue to, to push that. And I think this whole issue around the, the National Health Service too is, is so important, but not just the National Health Service. I mean, what we've seen as a result of the, the model that's been, well, introduced by Thatcher and then embraced by uh, New Labour uh, was the public services, including the National Health Service, was seen as a cash cow that was yeah. used to generate profits for the private sector. And, uh, you know, we've made it very clear that, you know, there is no place for the private sector in, in delivering the NHS services and we will we'll repeal that um, uh, Health and Social Care Act and that we will absolutely change that whole dynamic where the, the private sector are essentially ripping off the NHS. And we therefore need an entirely you know, nationalised national health service. And there's overwhelming support for that across the, the country. That, and... I think we should be going further, though, and saying, you know, the private sector's really got no place in delivering any public services, actually, you know? I mean, public service yes. should be right. <laughs> we should be entirely about delivering uh, good quality, decent public services for people, not generating private profits. Because what we've seen where public services have been hived off to the private sector is that terms and conditions of workers of uh, delivering those services have been diminished, and very often the quality of the service that's provided is inferior to that that's delivered by the public sector. That's not to say everything's perfect in the public sector, but it's more accountable and you've got greater opportunities, I think, to, to, to correct the, um, the, the errors if and when they do take uh, place. But, of course, one of the issues, for example, with the privatisation, the outsourcing of public services, is that the companies that are delivering those public services are no longer subject to, or the services are no longer subject to, the Freedom of Information Act. You can't get any kind of information about what, what, you know, what, what, what's going on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was a disappointment, I think, or one of the many disappointments of, of the new Labour era, where we continued with that whole privatisation agenda and sort of accelerated <coughs> it in, in some ways and embraced the private finance initiative. And I think it was done with the best of motives. It was a way of getting investment into uh, the, uh, the public realm without it appearing on the bottom line, because we were obsessed with, you know, the PS public sector borrowing requirements and appearing to be fiscally prudent and all that kind of nonsense. But uh, uh, it's, it's left us, it's mortgaged the future. And, uh, you know, one of the other great things that John McDonnell announced, I think it was at a conference before last, 
if I'm not mistaken, or was it this one where he said we'll bring back in those PFI contracts, and that's absolutely the right way to go, I think. And then just on the relation to uh, to housing, which is the area that I was asked to say a few words about. I mean, we have a massive housing crisis, don't we, right across the country. I mentioned in my opening remarks about how you know, working class youngsters like me in the 70s were able to aspire to buy our own home. And although we were quite young in buying a house at 19, it wasn't uh, that unusual. Um, but most people, if they'd not bought in the teens, would have, would have moved out anyway uh, in their sort of early 20s in that era. And if they didn't buy, they'd get a council house, because there was lots of council houses being built at that time, wasn't there? And we've ended up with a situation where, uh, you know, the right to buy was introduced by Thatcher when she came in in 1979. And by the way, that was a Labour policy, you know, in 1959. I don't know if you know that. It was in the Labour Party's uh, manifesto in 1959. But a version, a, a Labour version of the right to buy, of course, would have been done in a much more sustainable way uh, than it has been with the uh, Conservatives because you know houses have logged off and then we never replaced them did we mm -hmm. but what we also said or what they also said was that the providers of new public housing would be housing associations but they said we want you as housing associations to build the public houses the new public housing but uh, we're going to cut the social housing grant but then they said, but don't worry about that because you can just in, uh, borrow the money, uh, the difference from the money markets. And don't worry about the extra loan charges because you can service them through higher rents. And don't worry about your higher rents because we'll subsidise them through housing benefit. And then you sort of fast forward a few more years to the Housing Act uh, in 1989, I think it was, where they deregulated the private rented sector. And then when Clive Soley challenged uh, George Young in the House of Commons after this had been passed and, and, and said, quite surely was our housing spokesperson at the time, Shadow Housing Minister, said, well, rents are going through the roof. You know, the, in the public sector, they're, they're increasing um, because of the high rents in the, in the housing association sector for, because of, you know, housing associations are borrowing on the money markets and having to increase the rents to service the loan charges. The deregulated private renter sector had seen rents go through the roof. And so he was saying, look, how are people supposed to afford to pay these rents and his precise words were if you look in hindsight you can see if people can't afford to pay market rents housing benefit will take the strain well he's not wrong there because mm -hmm. we've ended up now spending around about 24 or 25 billion pounds a year on subsidizing high rents in the country around mm -hmm. 10 billion of that is going to private landlords mm -hmm. stuffed in the back pocket mm -hmm. nice money if you can get it uh, and then um, the remainder, some of that goes for uh, council rents, yes, but a bigger proportion um, of the remaining 15, 14 or 15 billion is for housing association rents. And uh, if you think about it, therefore, what this Conservative Party has, has done, this is the party that claims to be the custodians of the public purse, by the way, mm. is to use housing benefit, public money, to enrich private landlords and to generate bankers' bonuses. Yeah. 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 Now that's an absolute scandal, isn't it? Yeah. But yeah. where's the media actually highlighting this scandal? And frankly, where were we when we were in government? Because we continued with that model in those 13 years. That's the sadness. We continued with that with that model, and we you know we sh we should have regulated the private rental sector, uh, and we should have started building council houses again. But we never never did that. And we had a curious policy of rent convergence as well during our period in office, where we said that council rents had to rise at RPI plus a few more percentage points uh, and housing associations could only increase their rents at RPI uh, with the idea to being that council rents and housing association rents would would uh, you know equalize over time and, and to me I take a fairly simplistic view a bit like the Clay Cross rent rebels all those years ago hey. who were uh, you know advocates of municipal socialism uh, and they refused to implement the rent act didn't they that Thatcher, that, uh, Thatcher Ted Heath it was actually um, trying to force them to increase their uh, rents because they took a fairly straightforward view that you should keep rents in the public sector public rents should be low so that you know people on low incomes can have the dignity of being able to pay their own way mm. I mean part of the problem with 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 means tested benefits is that and because the way it's been they've been stigmatized is that often people don't claim them they feel too ashamed to, to claim them it's an absolute scandal that that is what is happening but that I'm afraid is, is the case and I was looking at something the other day where they're 
I think it was the UN uh, special uh, uh, rapporteur was saying uh, when in his uh, investigation, they're saying there's you know, 1.5 million in extreme poverty in the nation that is the sixth biggest economy in the world. That around 30 percent of uh, universal credit applicants give up; mm. they don't yeah. complete their application. Yeah. You know, this is an utter scandal that's going on. And again, regrettably, the media hasn't done its job in actually, you know, highlighting that. But we've got an opportunity now, haven't we, to put forward a, a programme that, uh, you know, is really resonating with, with people. This, this manifesto here, you know, is, is, is one that really did resonate with people. Um, I described it as the best manifesto since 1945. That was a, a bit of hyperbole because I think there's been some more, ra more radical propositions than, than this one. But this was a manifesto which did resonate, I think, with, with people. There was such a massive appetite for a socialist alternative, for a progressive alternative to what we'd had for the last, well, nearly four decades, to be fair. And um, we're in the fifth print run, you know, with this, by the way. And uh, I mean, I've been in the party for 42 years and I've campaigned in every single uh, local and, uh, and national election since that time. And I've never known people to talk about the manifesto on the doorstep. I don't know whether you've uh, found that, but. Uh, you know, people couldn't get enough of it, really. It's incredible. It's, a, it's not exactly a bestseller, but it's, you know, it's not far short of that. And that's just fantastic. But look, the next manifesto will be, will be bolder, will be more uh, radical. And this is where, again, the members can have a major role, I think, in, in, in helping to, you know, create the space to, to deliver that. Um, and uh, I, I just think that, as I say, you know, the support for the sort of alternative that we're putting forward now is, 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 is overwhelming and so as I say it's very easy now to campaign for the Labour Party but it was Ed Miliband who said that if we had listened to our members when we were in government between 1997 and 2010 we wouldn't have made as many mistakes and uh, he's absolutely right in that in that statement because if you think about it, if we'd listened to members, there'd have been no war in Iraq. There'd have been no tuition fees, would there? There'd have been no privatisation of the uh, NHS, because it was Labour that brought in private uh, health care. We, we wouldn't have put benefits to the poorest people in society. We wouldn't have deregulated, the, or further deregulated, the, the uh, money markets as we did. We'd have had a council house building program. So, you know, one of the things that I was hoping would come through the uh, democracy review was the um, proposal that was contained in it to give members a greater opportunity to have an influence over the direction of travel of the party. We could embrace digital democracy, you know, use this new technology to give all members an opportunity to have a say over policy. But regrettably, the outgoing NEC or the NEC that signed off on the democracy review kiboshed quite a lot of the ideas that were coming through and that was one of them and so I think that we need to revisit that because if we can put members in the driving seat not only will we I think get better policy um, we will uh, ensure that we have a better chance of winning the next election and we will be in a better place to stay in power when we get there because there'll be huge pressure put on the party when we win and we're already seeing it now with the smears and the attacks that we're being subjected yeah. to but but that's because we you know we, we're going to shake up the status quo yeah. I mean again you know Ed used to always say uh, when he was leader the thing that used to upset him most of all you may have heard him say this was when people said you're all the same and I used to think well Ed you're the leader kind of like kind of come forward with more with a more radical proposal uh, in terms of our uh, policy going forward and uh, you know we, we had to fight tooth and nail just to get a commitment to uh, say that we will abolish the uh, bedroom tax and um, so obviously it was a better proposition than what the Tories are putting forward but a lot of people and I lost my seat on the basis of that really felt that there wasn't sufficient difference between what we were putting forward and what the Tories were putting forward and a lot of people didn't vote a lot of people ended up voting UKIP and uh, a lot of people uh, you know, voted for the Green Party. Across the country in 2015, the 15.6 million didn't vote. Nearly 4 million voted for UKIP, uh, and 1.5 million voted for the Greens. They were the biggest cohort, the non-voters, 
uh, in that election by a, by a big distance, around 11 and a half uh, million, I think it was, the Tories uh, achieved, and that's what gave them an overall majority. Um, and in my own constituency in 2015, the Tories won with 16 and a half thousand, we were just 41 votes behind them, but the non-voters were 25,000. And so there's a big job for us, I think, to do in, in actually reaching out to the, those non-voters and appealing to uh, people and finding a way of doing politics with people, not to people. You know, we, we can't be just, it can't be just about going and knocking on doors. That's really important. But we've got to be getting much more embedded in the community and so that people feel that, you know, the Labour Party is part of the community and that we're on their side. And, you know, there is, as I say, overwhelming support for our uh, policy programme going uh, forward so in that sense we're in, we're in a good we're, a, we're in a good place uh, but still even at the last election although we did up our votes substantially we got two million more votes than we'd uh, uh, or two million votes from people who didn't normally vote should I say uh, we got the biggest increase in vote share since 1945 uh, but we didn't just quite get over the line but when you think about the running to that election I mean you could have had a worse running could you I mean, with uh, you know, with the coup and the attacks that, that uh, the leadership were being put under by our own side, uh, to actually have achieved what we did was absolutely remarkable. And I think had that campaign gone on another week or so, we would have, you know, we'd have probably seen Jeremy in number ten, to be honest with you. So I think we've got every chance of, of winning the next uh, election. Um, bearing in mind, we went into the last one 25 points behind, and then we ended up with the biggest vote share, as I say, since 1945. If we can go into the next election. You know, even Stevens, or a bit ahead, I'd like to be. I mean, crikey me, we could be sweeping the board. And given the the, uh, the 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 Brexit mess that the Tories are in at the moment, you know, there's every possibility of an early uh, election. And uh, you know, we need to seize the moment whenever the election comes. But I think that democratisation is so important. And it was Tony Benn again, I quote him quite a bit actually, who said that uh, democracy is the most revolutionary thing in the world. And uh, you know, whenever grassroots party members, whenever you know, ordinary members of the public get a bit of power, there's, there's a reaction to try and quell that, to try and you know, put people back in their box, as it were. We saw it 200 years ago, the Peterloo Massacre, or we'll be commemorating the 200th anniversary of that. That were people then you know, demanding the right to vote, demanding a better share of the nation's wealth, etc., and the establishment ruthlessly put them down. And, the aftermath of that, of course, is a, there's a film. Have people seen the film, Peter? Mm -hmm. It's not a bad film. It's a bit too long, in my opinion. They could have a bit of better job. It's well worth a watch, anyway. Um, but uh, they banned mass meetings, but they also uh, placed uh, restrictions on the distribution of um, of uh, newsletters. The information is power in it, you know. And uh, they put punitive taxes on on those uh, pamphleteers so that were uh, distributing information to kind of working class communities. Well, a similar sort of thing is happening today with the, with the restrictions that they want to bring into the social media. What was brilliant, I think, about the last campaign and why it was very different, I think, to what happened when Tony Benn was in his pomp in the early 1980s and in the run into that 1983 general election where we got wiped out, obviously the SDP didn't, didn't help there, was that the media were able to get away with this complete demonisation and, and, and misrepresentation and there's no real means of, of um, responding or charging <coughs> that back other than you know, meetings like this and talking to people mouth to, you know, face to face and distributing um, you know, leaflets through people's doors. Now, of course, we're able to reach out to millions of people. It's incredible. I mean, the, those Momentum videos, for example, we're getting 12, 13, 14, 15 million views. Incredible. Far more than what the, you know, the Daily Mail and uh, the Sun and the rest of it were, were achieving. And so they were incredibly depressed about the whole situation that they weren't able to control it, you know. And um, it felt a bit like the scene, and people seen a very British coup where the, where the media, there's like a left-wing government comes to power and the media have been doing their best to demonise them, but they come to power against all the odds. And uh, they just can't believe how this, is, uh, this has happened. Well, I think in a similar sort of way, although the Tories, as we know, did just manage to, to get over the line. But that mass movement that we now have at our disposal, the access to social media, a programme of uh, common sense socialist uh, policies which are you know, hugely popular with the, with the public. Do people see uh, Giles Brandeth looking for secret socialists in, mm. in Guildford? Yeah. Yeah. Has everybody seen that? Yeah. It's, uh, well, he goes round and he's got this, like, he's got like a clipboard like this here. 
and he's oh, got yes, uh, yeah. he's got a series. Oh, it's not a clipboard, but you can just imagine it's a clipboard. <laughs> and he's got about half a dozen policies on there, like about tuition fees, I think, and railways, bring the railways back to public ownership, uh, the housing program, uh, kicking the privateers out of the NHS, etc. And uh, asking people, they say, "Excuse me, sir, uh, do you, you know they go through? Do you support these?" And they go, "Oh, yes, yes, that's a very great idea. Yes, yes, I really do." Yeah. And Jewish fees, oh, we have a very sensible. Bring the railways back. And, yes, yes, about time too. The railways are very <laughs> terrible. And then same, you know, stop a woman. You know, there's men and women, and right the way, no, no difference gender-wise. You know, they were all kind of really supportive. And then he was saying, "Well, you're a secret socialist, then, madam." <laughs> <laughs> and then saying, so they were kind of going, oh, "What do you mean by that?" <laughs> and they said, "Well, these are the policies of Jeremy Corbyn." <laughs> and then he turned it round. There's a big picture of. Jeremy on <laughs> and uh, they kind of step back in horror, you know. Yeah. Well, of course, Jeremy had been demonised uh, during that time, hadn't he? Yes. And uh, yes. in the election campaign, of course, we had this fantastic mass movement, we had the social media campaign, which was brilliant, but people were also able to see Jeremy on the mainstream media, and they actually then recognised that he didn't have two horns and a tail. <laughs> he was actually quite a decent geezer and uh, spoke a lot of common sense. And uh, that's clearly, I think, what is absolutely on our side. And uh, I think, you know, with, uh, with the sort of policies that we're, that we're uh, putting forward, with the uh, notion that we need to democratise our economy, because that is absolutely key, I think, you know, embracing, as I was saying earlier, the, the technological uh, revolution, uh, you, you know, we can actually create a situation where we, you know, we have a good society, where we can like reduce the working week, where we can pay the pensions to people, where we can even bring, a, bring about uh, Tony Benn's idea of uh, increasing the school leaving age to 75 as he once uh, said. <laughs> but um, uh, you may not know though that he then received a letter from a disgruntled 85 year old <laughs> who said to him, uh, dear Mr Benn, why are you discriminating against me? I've just graduated from the Open University. <laughs> And according to you, I shouldn't be entitled to do that. So I said, I've changed my position. There should be no upper age limit on lifelong learning. Well, we can kind of... Absolutely, yes. Yeah, deserves a, right, a round of applause, I think. Yeah, uh, it does. But um, that's, a, that's the kind of prize that we are fighting for, I think. And so, you know, winning this election is absolutely key. I think there's a, got a great opportunity of winning in places like uh, uh, Weymouth here. What's the constituency's name? Is it just Weymouth? Is South Dorset. What's it called? South Dorset. Oh, South Dorset. Is it? What was the majority here then? Uh, when when Jim Knight was the MP, yeah. which was in, before 2010. Yeah. What was it? Yeah. yeah, well, there you go. Well, that's, uh, that's an easy uh, <laughs> <laughs> Bear in mind, we've got all these secret socialists all over the place, so we, uh, you know, we should be able to, uh, to to win them over. I mean, one of the things that I'm also be interested in your take on this is uh, just in relation to uh, you know democracy is uh, that we, in my opinion, should embrace electoral reform as well. I think, and yes. uh, I would yes. like to see. Not just a pure list system. I used to be a big advocate of first past the post, I thought that was the best way to go. But I, I think that if we could have a hybrid system, similar to what I think they've got in Scotland, where you have you know bigger constituencies, but it enables you to keep a constituency link in that sense, and then you have a top up system, people yeah. elected off a list. That then gives a uh, an incentive, I think, to activists, to Labour supporters all over the country, even the safest Tory seat, to maximise the Labour vote, because that will then maximise or increase the number of people that we can get off the list, off the top up uh, list. And I think that would be a way of bringing more people in to the uh, uh, political sphere and to encourage people to participate in the democratic uh, process. So, with democratising our party, to give people greater opportunity to influence the direction of travel of the party, greater power over the selection of candidates, greater <coughs> power over the local council as well. There's an idea that we should elect the council, the Labour group leaders in local authorities, and that we should once again give the power to members to draw up the local manifesto as well, rather than it being the the preserve of the Labour group. All of those things together, together with you know democratising our economy, creating more worker cooperatives, not embracing public ownership of the model that was introduced in 1945, which is very much a top-down one, but this would be very much of a bottom-up approach. So municipalisation and, as I've said, cooperatives would be the <coughs> rule of thumb. Because when the Tories came in in 1979 with this notion of a property-owning, shareholding democracy, that was quite seductive. And a lot of people, I think, were, you know, did buy into that. And when we would argue, we, we already owned the gas and the electricity, mm -hmm. the water, people yeah. didn't really feel like they owned it. 
because it was just remote bureaucrats that were running it and they didn't feel any connection with it whatsoever. So we must not make that mistake again. And one of the most radical proposals in, in this manifesto was the right to own. So that uh, any company that is subject to uh, asset stripping by a hedge fund or offshoring jobs to low wage economies, which we've seen loads of jobs go that way, will no longer be able to do that because the workers will be given the first right of refusal to buy out that company and create a worker cooperative. And it won't just be a theoretical right, it will be a right underpinned by the National Investment Bank and an agency to do the, or to help the workforce do the necessary legals and the financials, etc. So these are quite radical proposals. And what we're talking about is an irreversible, and the emphasis being on irreversible, mm. shift in the balance of wealth and power in our country. Mm. That is a massive prize, and I always say to people, that we should be inspired by that great protest song that the civil rights campaigners was used as their anthem in the 1950s and 60s in the deep south of the United States when they were campaigning to get people to register to vote and the rest of it and for civil rights and it was keep your eyes on the prize and the, uh, we need to keep our eyes on the prize so it's not just about winning the next election it's literally about changing the course of history so you're not just ordinary Labour Party members here today you are history makers comrades, I don't want to kind of put the bird, weight the burden too much on your shoulders, <laughs> but you are going to be in the process of changing the course of history. And as Tony Benn uh, said, there are, keep quoting Tony Benn, don't I? sorry about that, he was a great man though. There are two flames that burn in the human heart, the flame of anger against injustice and the flame of hope that we can build a better world. And our job I think is to inject that sense of hope, that, that sense that you know, another world is possible. Another world is possible. So within touching distance. And we, together, can actually make that happen. And the final quote I just want to finish with is the one from the Shawshank Redemption, which I often trot out, which people may or may not have seen, where uh, Andy Dufresne, he, he's, he gets thrown into solitary confinement after he, he's in the office, he's in the governor's office, and he locks the door and he plays this beautiful opera music and he puts it over the tannoy and there's all the convicts in the in the square in the exercise yard they're all looking they're all like sort of like carried away into a different plane with this beautiful music in this horrible barren environment that they're in anyway he gets severely punished for his for his troubles and when he comes out of solitary confinement he's, he's goes into the mess room and he's having dinner with the with his fellow uh, inmates and they say well, what was all that about andy and uh, they have a bit of a dialogue and, and in the end he sort of says, well, it's about hope. It's about giving people hope. And then Red Redding says to Andy, hope is a very dangerous thing in this place. <laughs> <laughs> they said hope could drive a man insane in a place like this. And uh, Andy's response is, no, Red. Hope is a good thing. Maybe the best of things. And no good thing ever dies. <laughs> And thanks to Jeremy and John and Diane and a few others, you know, that, that flame of socialism didn't die inside the Parliamentary Labour Party. They kept it alive and managed to rekindle the flames when uh, he put his name forward onto the ballot paper. And it's, and it's grown into this, this, this huge bonfire now and there's massive, massive support for it here and around the world. And just to add a little bit more pressure onto your uh, shoulders, uh, the eyes of the world are really upon us. Mm, yeah. And I think there's a real chance for us to see a sea change throughout the world. Just as what happened when Thatcher and Reagan came to power. And given that there is now in the States, I know we've got Trump there at the moment, but there is huge support for a socialist mm. alternative. Uh, and I think we really can. We really can change, change the, the course of, of history, change the world. And together, comrades, we can achieve that. So what I would say to you is my message is to let's go out, win the election, let's go out and make history together. Thank you for listening.